Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming along. It's been a very interesting challenge, Jeff. He's caught me at my soft spot and got me to take it on. Um, Many years ago, when my wife and I were still young, we traveled to Crete and hiked down the gorge of Samaria, which you see there. A deep gorge that leads from the flanks of the White Mountain in the center of the island down to the Mediterranean. On the way down, we collected a number of fellow travelers. As we reached the end of our odyssey, and came in sight of the sea, just as Xenophon's Greeks had done when they too caught sight of the sea, I threw my arm to the heavens and gave the great cry, Thalassa, Thalassa. The others looked at me as if I was bonkers. My wife, however, was unperturbed. She already knew that engineers are all bonkers. And so my title tonight is Thalassophilia, for the love of the sea. It's something that gets into your bones if you give it half a chance. You never get it out. It is a great honor to be asked to present the 70th Snape Memorial Lecture this year, 2022, to commemorate the late Alfred Snape, first professor of civil engineering at UCT, and the study of this great enterprise in Southern Africa, to the practice of civil engineering in Africa in all its manifestations, and for the greater good of all people on this great continent. By the time I started at UCT in the late 1950s, we still knew of the late Professor Snape, but none of us had any real knowledge of him. Mostly, we knew of his dictum, that engineering was not just a matter of learning formula. He himself only remembered two. For the rest, it was to know where and how to find information and to understand it. It is my fervent hope that this rendition of mine will do justice to the great tradition of this name memorial. In this manner, with the tip of my hat to the memory of the old professor, I will talk of engineering and of fellow travellers I have had the privilege of meeting on this the journey of my life. This year, my rendition will be a love story, my love of the sea, my love of engineering, of life in the open, shaping and moulding the very earth itself, of bending the spirit of the sea to my designs, and of men I have met on the way, and beyond all else, the love of my life. My late wife Daphne, a Rhodesian and an engineer's daughter, without all whom I could not have achieved any of this. Sometimes blue, or should I say the blues, is used very expressively as an allegory for sadness or depressions. Just writing a sentence like this evokes those feelings, and the feelings are boring, depressing places. But that only applies to the word blue when it is used in this allegorical sense. There is another blue, a real blue, the color that dominates the nature in the blue of the sky and on the blue of the sea, as an allegory for the sea itself. The sea is not limited to sadness and depression. It can do this, but usually in real and constructive ways. The sea can evoke the full spectrum of emotions. It is the great healer of the soul. It quiets the disturbed and regenerates the spirit of those who come to it. It is a common perception that the sea has an emotional tug on people. The sea is perhaps best captured by the opening lines of John Maysfield's Sea Fever. I must down to the seas again, to the lonely sea in the sky. This is an effect that is commonly ignored, not even mentioned in the bulk of the commerce of oceans economy, really only noticed in coastal and beach recreation, in sport, in seaside property, and in artisanal fishing and similar artisanal activities. But this effect is in fact very strong wherever people inter interact with the sea, even if it is not noticed in the major commercial and industrial activity. Many years ago, I had a brief and delightful correspondence 
with the late Professor Philip Tobias on the matter of our aquatic associations. The following is an extract from his comment. The aquatic theory, which was started by Sir Alistair Hardy, is very attractive indeed, but we have no direct evidence to support this view. Nevertheless, the idea of human beings walking along the beach and eating seafoods is most attractive as they are a rich source of protein and would have been extremely useful at a stage before these bipedal terrestrial hominids had acquired the skill to hunt. The blue mind effect is a matter that we as marine engineers need to take heed of. There is no question that the great works we perform have a strong influence on the blue mind of people in general, whether for good or ill. But the influence is as strong on ourselves and our chosen profession. We need to recognize the effects on ourselves as much for our own good and motivation and well-being as for that of society at large. The ancient Greeks held that the earth shaker, Poseidon, god of tectonics, and was, above all else, god of the sea. His realm is a great bloom, the great boon of mankind. There's great practicality to the sea. It is a source of all life on earth. And as the great highway of the world, the mother and father of civilization, it fosters engineering great and small, ships that sail on the sea and harbors and shore protection works. But beyond and above, it is the great nurturer of humankind. My earliest memories. Yeah, I've been reading too fast. That was the co of the love of the day. My earliest memories, not yet four years old, not long before Pearl Harbor, are of home in a corrugated iron shack, the Kia on the Kaya on First Beach, Clifton. It was quite a nice shack. It was built up on stilts, clear of the surge of the storm. It was a high watermark. And we had a bathroom inside and a flush toilet outside. It was wartime then and we had blackout. There were German wolf packs operating off the Cape and my father was away serving in the mid. Sometimes we would wait in the morning to a sea covered with ships as far as I could see. Great convoys steaming to the Battle of El Alamein or the Burma campaign. Afterwards, the beach would be covered with hairy mango pips and bull cream. To this day, I still can't face mangoes. Mostly the sea would leave a layer of foam on the beach. Often it was colored green, like the fuel of torpedo ships. Often we had recuperating sailors, survivors staying with us, quiet men coming to terms with their ordeal. When my father came home from war, we moved to the high dry interior to seas of waving yellow grass, of big blue skies and long rolling hills, interspersed with flat-top dolorific islands, covered with wild olive trees. <coughs> Meandering strips of bright green willow marked the passage of the sprites. It was the most marvellous page for kids to grow up. We had not been there long when I got my first bicycle, and soon it was National Air Week. A few of us rode out on our bikes to Renostasprit, where it was happening. A highlight was the arrival of the new vampire jets. Three of them, I think, did a low-level fly past at full throttle, really impressive. Then the announcer, announcer came on the PA to say that a Spitfire would do the same, to show that whatever a jet could do, a Spit could do, do better. He came past at low level again, at full throttle. A flash of oval wing, a bellow of Merlin engine. Spectacular. But even as a small boy, I could sense the futility of his magnificent gesture. But a marvellous lesson in obsolescence. Some years, I, some years ago, I tracked down the persons involved. By then, both retired. For the vampires, it was Tank Wardendahl. For the Spitfires, it was Bob Rogers. Both dug out their old long walks and both came back to me to, de to deny any knowledge of the incident. Although always at the back of my mind, I was yearning for the sea. Still, these were wonderful years. They were my learning years. 
At school, it was a time when we still had the privilege of choosing to take Latin. It was a language made for people with mathematical minds, as long as it's taught as a dead language. A Latin class was dominated by the STEM types. Often, I took the prize in Latin. Without Latin, I would have struggled with my other two languages. My only regret is that we were deprived of a little Greek to go with our Latin. Many years later, Um, I keep forgetting to do my own stuff. Hmm? Try to take No, it's on. It, it, it's come through properly. It was my fault. No, it's not just clicking. Uh, oh. No, oh, that was uh, a corrugated iron canoe. Uh, some of you remember know uh, Alan Trekker. That's him in the front. Many years later, touring in Greece, Daphne and I took a bus to the 3,000-year-old ruin of the citadel of Tiryns. Finished exploring, we headed back to the main road, a long barren road with only telephone poles for company. How to get back? Looking around, I spotted a small sign on one of the poles written in Greek. From my man, man has mathematics, I could read this in English as stasis. For my physics, I knew that meant stop. We only waited a short while under the sign before a bus, bus came along and stopped for us. <laughs> Daphne was suitably impressed. Straight out of university, I was very fortunate to obtain a postgraduate pupillage with Sir Alexander Gibbon Partners at the offices in Queen Anne's Gate in Westminster. I started at Gibbs in the drawing office, two years before the boards, on power station design, and then another two years on site on the construction of Tilbury B power station. When it came on stream some months after I had left at 1,350 megawatts, it was the biggest in Britain for a few months until the next bigger station came on stream. A sense of the dynamism in Britain in those years. The reality of a large drawing office was something I was completely unprepared for. Everything appeared normal the way it should be, but it was like nothing I'd, uh, nothing I'd come across at university or in any of the consulting offices I'd worked in during the VAX. Now I was really learning engineering from the bottom up. All the reality, all the basics that are so essential to the practice of engineering. The four years I spent in London serving my pupillage was the height of the swinging 60s, the Beatles and all that, of the economic boom of Harold Macmillan's You've Never Had It So Good. In those days in London, there were still old bomb sites and crammed up in tubes we could still see how people were patching and reusing their clothing. But for all that, it was an amazing time and place to be alive. In London one December, I was invited to a braai on good old 16th of the month. Bloody cold, but it went down well. There I met Daphne, my future wife. That is the car station. Uh, the two chimneys I supervised, the thing with the arrow on it I supervised, the switchgear yard I supervised, the, uh, the transformer bay right in the front, all those little walls I supervised, and one of the two other structures elsewhere in the back of the thing. We'd see the pictures going in, if the lights were turned down, why can't they be turned down? In the front lights. Can you do something about it, too? Uh, I can. I just, um, you were struggling, you were trying to see it earlier, but let's see if it makes yeah, okay, it's Is that better? There we are, we better. Uh, I, I can just about be, I'll be alright. I'll, I'll shout him, I can't. Shortly after we get we, we met, I got my turn to go on site to Tilbury B on the, on the Thames estuary. I can never forget how excited I was. Every boy's dream to be stationed on a major construction site bustling with activity and big machines and people coming and going. 
When I arrived on site, I was issued with my hard hat, a donkey jacket, and a pair of steel toe cap boots. On site, I always got as close to the action as possible, and soon my kit was suitably blotched with concrete. In both the office and the site stages, we were being used as cheap labor, but we were not only experiencing both aspects of real large-scale large construction, we were being actively monitored and guided, mentored. On site, we had to write all the routine site letters, but always under the supervision of our immediate superior, senior. Not just checking what we wrote, but also our command of English, especially construction English, which owes a lot to both archaic French and early Anglo-Saxon. It was an amazing learning experience that has served me well my whole career. On the way home from site, I would call on Daphne. She told me one day that her landlord had come to her to say he was very concerned for her. He didn't think it was uh, think that a nice girl like her should be going out with a navvy like me. <laughs> I must say that, on the one hand, I was impressed that he recognised my concrete battle armors, but on the other, somewhat miffed that I had a degree in engineering and worked for one of the snootiest engineering firms in London. Correct, is it, uh, John? I've always had an eclectic interest in history, and over the years, I've picked up a number of interesting threads. Not long ago, I received a letter of inquiry about one of these from a clergyman in Essex. Turned out he lived within sight of the old power station, and it was being demolished at the time. He very kindly sent me press cuttings of the process. I took two things from those days. One was the physical ambience of construction, both in the design office and on site, of how things were done. The other much more subtle, but far deeper. It concerns the etiquette of construction, of communication, both in the office and on site, particularly on site. First thing a snotty nose, a young engineer from university arriving in a design office or on site, must learn of the protocols of construction, of communication with draftsmen, old or young, and particularly chief draftsmen, or on site, labourers, artisans, and again, particularly the foremen. These are men who have come up from the tools. The more senior they are, the more sensitive they are to their lack of formal education and tend to, be, tend to brittle personalities. They need to be treated very delicately. These men can break the careers of any snotty nose who fails to learn the protocols. On the other hand, for a senior engineer who still uses the protocols and knows what he is doing, these men will go to the ends of the earth for their engineer, no matter how much they bicker and cop. Don't ask me what these protocols are, I don't know. Once learned, one just uses them. Once in discussion, a senior colleague concurred, but thought that at root it was a matter of respect. I think he was largely right. Xenophon, 2,400 years ago, said much the same thing when he said of the Kloistes, the pulling masters, the coxswains on the great triremes, that the men under a good Kloistes come ashore sweating and congratulating each other. Those under a poor Kloistes do not pull as well and come ashore cold, hating him and hated by him. At the end of my pupillage, I came home, married Daphne and joined Stuart Sviroff and Oliver in their Johannesburg offices in Balgani House, corner of Commissioner Street and Paul Sauer Streets. I like to think that throughout our lives together, once we were married, we followed so well the opinions of the father. But the best behaviour of a man and woman is that which will keep up their property and increase it as far as may be done by honest and legal means. Now I had finished my basic training. I knew my stuff and I knew how to use it. Now I was one of the workhorses. Those were the most fabulous times of my whole career. I said I would prefer to work on water projects and they were very good to me. 
I'll never forget my first encounter with one of the partners, Bill Glass, a quintessential Englishman born in India, the most amazing man to work for. He put me to work developing the hydrology of the Pauks River. I dug out my old lecture notes from Tony Kilner, time of concentration and all that, and a series of annual MET reports from the office archives and set to work. I was just getting on nicely when Bill came down to see how I was doing. I very proudly showed him what I'd done, and his response was, good God, boy, hasn't anybody told you? In South Africa, that doesn't work. And then he explained how I should be doing, should be going about things. And the work that Midgley was doing at WITS, that the firm was constantly monitoring. Although it was a, a, a long time ago, the response to that admonition was not much different to what it would be today. Yet from Bill, such a problem did not exist. Later, when construction of the Box Dam was starting, just before Christmas, I was sent up to keep an eye on things. One of the contractors, Big Bigs, came over and gave me a box of three bottles of Dimple Haig. One for the partner, one for the senior engineer, one for me. Back, to, back in Joburg, I took the three bottles to the office to build glass. His immediate response was, oh dear me, we can't have this. I'll phone their offices to send a messenger to fetch them. I've d deleted uh, other things. That <laughs> I must comment on my time with SSNO. The accommodation of the old building may have been a bit ropey, but the environment was superb. The partners are all gentlemen, very approachable, always willing to coach and to guide. I got my share to office, uh, share to office work, design and project management. But mostly I was out in the bush on recce surveys for dams, surveys of dam basins, wilder surveys and, the, and time as an REA on site. I did quite a lot of work under senior partner Michael Sverdov and greatly enjoyed working for him. He was the son of a white Russian general, a tall, thin, ascetic man, a consummate gentleman who spoke perfect English, if, if only one could understand his accent. Always he had a smile and a twinkle in his eye. Once he sent me on a recce with un, and only allowed me to take a broomstick, a pocket level and a pocket tape. He didn't want the farmers suspecting that I was looking for a dam or a dam site. For my part, I always went straight to the farmers to drink coffee with the farmer. I was nearly getting my Benny buckshot up my backside, then more coffee when I was leaving. In that particular case, given the dense bush at the site, the broomstick method proved to be the only way that the survey could have been done. After five years with SSNO, I was hankering to get back to the Cape, to the sea. I saw an ad for the Fishery Development Corporation and I took the gap. The technical department, the engineers of the FTC, was run by an Afrikaner, Piet Krobler, a solid Calvinist and, like the partners at SSNO, ran a tight ship and was an absolute joy to work for. So it was. 25 years after I'd left Clifton, that my wife and I returned to the sea to work at building the South African suite of fishing harbors and building a house at Nandadna. Here we lived for nigh on 50 years, ensconced in our airy, high above the sea, with only the mountain and the fame was behind. To see would we gazed forever into a blue infinity. A dynamic world of water, glowing blue, always changing, always the same. At the end of the day, we would watch the sun sink flaming into the sea, suffusing the world of blue, with shades of red and violet. In winter, great storms would come out of the west howling and moaning 
and at times roaring like Zeus, castigating Poseidon. They were magnificent, magical, cathartic. Each great gust harmonizing with the crashing of the waves on the rocks below. Snug at home, it cleansed the soul with a heightened sense of excitement and euphoria. I got to know the timber of the storms and cocked my ear and say, ship ashore tonight. Sure enough, next morning there would be a ship found it somewhere on the peninsula. One afternoon in a howling rain-lashed gale, more cyclone than gale, we got to watch a tragedy unfold. A great barge mounting a 3,000 ton crane was being towed to Cape Town when the storm struck. The towing tug was joined by another from the port, but together they couldn't hold the barge. It was a titanic struggle, like a great game of rugby at Newlands that surges back and forth. So the tugs battled the storm winds. In the end, it was the storm that won. The helicopters came in to take off the crew. Tugs cut the tow, and the barge was dashed from the rocks in Liuchat, below Kabonkoberg. There it still stands, a sad remnant, with the great girders of the crane still visible above the promontory of the Odyssey. In summer, the winds reverse, and the southeaster plays across the land, a sad and lonely wind that sings and whines like the wind they call Mariah. At times it screams across the flank of the mountains and out across the sea, flattening the sea like a faulty, chattering plain, sweeping great plumes and jars of spray to the sky, leaving an olive green sea with a lacework of spray above. The subliminal infrasound of the gusts against the glare of the pale blue sky engenders a strange, lonely depression. Summers were idyllic, Lang languid days with twilight lasting till after nine o'clock in the evening. And always, wherever we look, endless blue of the sea and the sky. Walking the beach in the early morning, before the sun had crested Judas Peak, was a time to watch how the waves would break. Sometimes spilling, mostly plunging, the roll of the surf and the cheeky swash surging up the beach. Daphne soon learned to love the sea and the fruits of the sea. She had an old grape picking basket that on occasion she would leave outside the front door with some money under it. Come morning, the money would be gone and the basket would be full of creep. At least that was her story and she stuck to it. <laughs> One evening, the wizard of surfing, the late Dr. James Kimo Walker and his wife Phyllis, came to supper. Daphne pulled a trick and came out of the kitchen with a tray overloaded with grief. Chemo's eyes came out and stalks on all his head with turkeys. We learned how to harvest the black mussels growing on the rocks on the seashore. Later in the evening, we would have some friends around and Daphne would prepare a mussel cook-up. Just mussels and brown bread, and cold white wine, a delightful soiree that only Daphne knew how to do just right. I had time once to write, to record the distilling of my thoughts, calming them with the constant sight of the sea peeping through the windows. Sometimes when I ran into a writer's block, I would take the dogs, walk down to the beach, and walk through the water knee-deep, waist-deep, just watching the sea, ice-cold water surging around my legs, watching the way the waves broke and beyond the unending blue with the occasional super tanker gliding past far away. Always I experienced a great catharsis standing on that beach in the early morning light, watching the break of the waves and listening to the crash of falling water above the murmur of the sea. On an occasion, the Zulu sage Krida Mutwa came to lunch. He had come to the sea, to the beach below, for the induction of two acolytes. Afterwards, he and his entourage came up for lunch. The old man was in full regalia, with a chunk of copper ingot around his neck, and he was exhausted. He had no familiarity with the sea and was totally overwhelmed by it. 
I talked to him quietly of the sea in all its moods, the quiet times and the storms, and what today we would call blue mind, and it relaxed him. When he left, he bestowed on me the simple Zulu name Manzi, water, an appropriate honor. Civil engineering is quintessentially working out in the open, out in the open felt, getting in the, immersed in the, in the earth itself. But nothing in the working world can surpass the sheer intellectual and emotional engagement of working with the sea. Even in the office, working with plans and drawings and calculations and specifications of steel and concrete and rock and all the other paraphernalia of engineering, every little part invokes the sea. Every little part somehow echoes the call of the blue in some subliminal part of the mind. But far beyond that are the regular visits to harbors and sites, or better yet, of being stationed there, of making real contact with the water. Over, over the years, the sea and I have become to know, come to know each other and become good friends. Walking along a breakwater in Crete with a Canadian professor of classics who had little taste for the sea. Every splash that came over the wall dumped on him. Not a drop touched me. Only once did I turn my back on the sea and I got slapped in the back for disrespecting it. Once in a dinghy, in what would have been the dark beneath a jetty, the morning sunlight diffracted up through the water, illuminating the whole space in a suffuse of blue. At the very end, three seals wallowed in ice cold water, and in the saturated air, steam came off their backs. The most scared I've ever been was in another dinghy, on another inspection of a jetty that suffered from extreme corrosion. It looked like it would collapse at any moment. As soon as I had my observations, I told my shipwright to get us the hell out of there. Yeah, but decades later, that jetty is still standing. Breakwaters, breakwaters are wondrous things. When one walks out to the end of a breakwater, one is at sea, far from land, yet still on solid, not in a rocking boat. All around is surging blue water. One has a sense of being part of the water, part of the blue, part of something innovating and ethereal, not the humdrum world of dry land. One morning I went up early to inspect a small breakwater I was building. Standing at the end, inspecting the work, something caught my attention. I turned around and looked up eye to eye with a full-grown great whale only a few metres away, or so it seemed, scratching his belly on sharp rocks of the harmony. We remained like that for some minutes, eyeing each other before we both moved off. When you love the sea, the sea giveth great mood of elation. Within the field of marine engineering, I have chosen to specialise in the art of dry docking ships. is very much the Cinderella of marine engineering, but one where I get to work with the ships themselves. To, to bring a great ship to the blocks in a graving dock engenders a marvelous sense of achievement. Going down later to check and walking under the stern gear that tells stories above brings a great sense of wonder and humility. Magnificent as these great docks are, it is the humble slipway that is the most technically complex and most satisfying to work with. Dry docking, slipways in particular, have seen little technical development. Compared to other fields, it is still suffused with the law of shipwrights. I've never been much into angling, but at times I've had the privilege of operating the winch and winding in the great mass of the vessel the biggest fish you could ever imagine. When I first started in this field, back in the 1970s, 
There was very little in the way of engineering text to guide this work, little more than a chapter in Minikin, so I made it my own. I had to teach myself naval architecture. I got started on a little book, Men for Sailors and Fishermen, and worked my, my way up until I had the makings of a whole new science <coughs> of dry docking of ships. I got my master's degree for that, but I've never published. Too many other things to do. What I have done is to write training manuals for dry docking and others, and others from general coastal engineering. In the early 80s, Lambert's Bay needed a new slipway. This was a good opportunity to modernize and upgrade the traditional pattern of our slipways. Uh, and so it was done. It was designed and Lloyd certified at 200 tons capacity. On a completely new concept of slipway designs, the going got tough. Each week I was spending half a week on site, half a week in the workshops and half a week in the office, or so it seemed. But it all worked out beautifully. Unexpectedly, my wife and daughter came up for the commissioning for the commissioning test to witness my triumph. So did the Lloyd Surveyor and Michael Stutterwood, the shipping journalist. Ah, getting confused here. Yeah. As per usual, nothing went right. Small things to fix and find out what else is needed. By then we were covered in a heavily graphited number two calcium grease that I had designed myself. Couldn't, I couldn't complain. And the language of turning the air blue, I looked up to see my guests all standing there with bemused expressions on their faces. We all laughed, got it finished. I got my Lloyd's ticket, first in the country, perhaps in the world for a slipway, and the Lloyd Surveyor took us all to lunch. Waiting for, the, uh, for this project to start, Daphne and I had toured in Scotland, driving through the lowlands under a heavy, heavy black sky, <clears throat> past Loch Marben, where Nikolai, Nik, Nikolai Flem, uh, Tolstoy, nephew of the Russian novelist and renowned Celtic scholar, would have it, was the last refuge of Merlin and the Magician. Where the, this was where the road bends east around to the Solway Firth. A hole in the clouds opened in the west and a beam of sunlight shone through. Ahead of us, uh, in the east, it made the most beautiful rainbow I have ever seen. We were driving through the fine fan of spray put up by a great truck. It changed the scale of the rainbow as it came through the spray and the rainbow deflected into our little car, onto our feet. We both noticed it, commented on the pot of gold and then forgot about it. At the end of my slipway project, I got a call from ZIC head office to say that they were to award me the Basil Reed gold medal for construction that year. So you see, there is gold at the end of the rainbow. <laughs> that was a very good year. The next year, 1988, Captain Emilio de Souza, a retired Portuguese super tanker skipper and son of one of the last skippers of the Cutty Sark, sailed a replica of the caravel of the Tholomew Dias from Portugal to Mossel Bay. Stripped down to about 100 tons, he left it on the slipway. About a kilometre away, across a railway line and up a 10 metre cliff, was an old stone-built flour mill. Carmi Fagan, the heritage architect, converted it into a maritime museum, complete, with a hall to receive the ship. Except no one knew how to get it there. The Cape Provincial Administration were responsible for the caravel and the museum without a clue as to what to do. When they heard it, I knew something about ships. They asked if I could do the job. I just said, sure, and left it at that. When I met Emilio, I explained to him that I intended to use a traditional Mediterranean ship sled, a system going back at least 3,000 years, 
He yeah, understood and approved. Fail complete. The whole thing worked like a dream, but it was hard work, unremitting 12 hours a day for about three weeks. The whole concept was new to us. I had to be there constantly, constantly monitoring, understanding what was happening, constantly guiding and instructing the team. I had intended supporting the vessel on, uh, on build studs off the sled, and this turned out to be much more complex than I'd expected. Both ends of each bulk had to be independently and uniquely screw, skew cut, and I had to puzzle out how to measure up to do that. Two men held up each bulk in turn, while the charge hand with the chainsaw lined up the marks and swung the chainsaw like a scimitar in one clean cut. Very few needed shims, very satisfying. We dragged the sled a kilometer to the museum over railway sleepers, slathered with that black grease of mine. The worst of the work was uplifting these sleepers and carrying them forward. I had brought along a load cell so we could monitor the friction drag. It was about what I expected, about 10%. The final jacking across the railway line and up into the, uh, the building was the worst. On Saturday, we worked late in the evening. Uh, the Sunday, straight through until about 10 the next morning, until the ves vessel was up and clear of the railway line. By that stage, I was knackered, so were the crew. We sent them all home, back to camp, to sleep. That evening, we arranged a bribe for them and gave them the next day off before we started on getting the vessel into the building. It's times like this that you have to have your men with you. Besides small perks, evening brides, so they didn't need a cook, and a better overtime payout. But more than that, it was very much a matter of following the protocols of construction and following the uniform. You can hear from their chatter if they are still with you, when, when, uh, when, when they too are looking ahead and volunteering to solve problems. At one stage, there was an outcrop of very hard blue quartzite ahead. I'd noticed this and was wondering what to do about it. And one of them came to me to say that if I gave him a compressor and a jackhammer, he could take it out. He did too, but I had to have a blacksmith on standby to keep sharpening the models. The men who created their own come-along chant for the job, and there was plenty of need of that too. They would chant, Hark, Mary Rose, to get a rhythm going. I never did find out the source of this chant. For us, the final pull into the hall was no, no orchestra. It was Dante's Hill. Again, we worked late into the evening. I was using four 20-ton hydraulic cable jokes I had developed for moving ships a diesel generator for the hydraulics and a diesel compressor for the rock drills all inside the hall. We were constantly drilling holes in the concrete for 50 millimeter diameter steel rods to anchor the pullers and constantly bending them. The noise was indescribable. What I remember more than anything else was working with our shipwright, the late James Kasner. A bull of a man, salt of the earth, confident of our archbishops. It was from him I learned practical, practical reality of engineering, of bush mechanics. On the caravel job, I asked for James for my foreman. He was not very impressed. He was in fact pissed off at having to leave town and proper engineering work for this nonsense. He nearly resigned when, I, when he realised I was going to carry the vessel on its bilges, not on the keel. With the caravel settled safely in the pit inside the museum, we knocked off for Christmas. I couldn't go back out a big dredging project coming up in Volvers Bay that needed my attention. I left James to come back and finish off for me. My last memory of that job was he and I sitting on the, ca on the concrete, our feet hanging in the pit with a vessel on temporary supports, discussing the permanent supports. What timber to use for the keel blocks? And how many? Six or seven? With two heavy bull studs each side, and so it was decided.
When I joined the FTC, dredging was a weakness of the firm. We ended up with backyard dredge uh, complaints to the International Chamber of Commerce about our tendering practice and sound dredging contracts. Clearly, dredging is not the simple activity it appeared. We couldn't continue like that. I decided to make a study of dredging. The problems turned out to be largely problems of contract administration, which is subtly different to ordinary construction. Once these and our project management had been sorted out appropriately, the problems went away. The Dutch are a really hard ass bunch. But do your homework and treat them square, and it's a pleasure to work with them. At the end of our last dredging contract, they sent in a, gr a, a really nice letter of commendation to us. When we did the Malthus Bay synchrolift, we designed a repair yard as beams on piles, an expensive way to do it. When it came to the extension, I thought to call in a geotechnical consultant to assess the foundation and got out my copy of Itenyi on beams and elastic foundation theory. The idea was great, but Itenyi hadn't covered the triangular case I, I wanted. I didn't trust my differential equation, so I called in a specialist. He soon sorted it out, and we cut the cost by half, but it cost me. A while later, he phoned me, would I be his external examiner? I didn't think it would be much to, uh, much to it. But a few months later, a pile of 100 scripts landed on my desk. I leave one. Uh, I had the great privilege to be the last person to learn corrosion science from Commander Wilfred Copenhagen, OBE. He was a chemist by training, a pioneer in marine corrosion, one of the founders of the South African Navy, and set up a training school for the Navy during the war. His name is still revered in Simon's town. My father went through his office of training under Kopi, as he was affectionately known, and just went hrumph when I mentioned his name. My wife adored the old man, and he gave her a copy of his recipe for Walter's Bay Mustard. Appropriate, perhaps. He had done a great deal of work on the sulfur eruptions in Walter's Bay that are biological, not tectonic. Along Canary Row in Walter's Bay, in the heyday of the pelagic fishery, during a sulphur eruption, the bay was peppered with blobs of bottom sludge oiled up on bubbles of hydrogen sulphide, plopping upwards like upside down cowpaps. The fish in the sea, eels and soles and all sorts of fish, would swim along on the surface gasping for air. Toby once gave me a copy of a paper on a floating island of compact sludge, about 100 metres long, with a freeboard of about 3 metres that popped up off Pelican Point, sometimes driving back from Swakowit in the afternoon with the sun westering across the bay. The whole sea would turn silver like a sheet of beaten metal. It was the free sulphur in the water that, left after the, uh, that was left after the hydrogen sulphide was oxidised at the surface. One morning in Walpus Bay, you got a ride on the pilot launch to Pelican Point. It was one of those days when the air was crystal clear after the morning fog had burned off. Without dust or sulphur, everything was bright and fresh and new, and the sea sparkled in its very best azure blue as our launch bounced through the swells on its way across the bay. When we landed, our two little girls scampered up the boardwalk to the lighthouse like Dorothy along the yellow brick road. We found a door to the lighthouse that opened into a long room with an equally long table. A row of light lighthouse keepers sat on each side, with the head lighthouse keeper at the end. In front of him was an enormous enamel teapot. He looked up and said, Do come in, we've been expecting you. And so it was, we had tea with the lighthouse keeper that would have been fit for hours. In later life, after fiscal, I got in some funny I got to some funny places around the world. It was perhaps Gabon in French Equatorial Africa that made the biggest impression. I did about 300 kilometers on the grey green greasy Ugui River in a pirogue, the western version of a dugout canoe. 
the dugout canoes are very long and with a large outboard board, they go like the clappers. I once saw a very small dugout with an old umdala in it. He couldn't afford an outboard. He had his wife in the back paddling. Very African. In this manner, I got to Lamborghini, where Albert Schweitzer had his hospital. I'd been led, been led to believe. Oh, that's me <laughs> in a pirogue. I'm still wearing a monocle in those days. Uh, even more it into Africa. Uh, in this uh, in this manner, I got to Lamborghini, where Albert Schweitzer had his hospital. I'd been led to believe that Schweitzer had committed his life to one of the cesspits of Africa. Nothing could be further from the truth. He had chosen one of the most beautiful places on earth to found his hospital. Today, it is the site of a teaching hospital. The underbush cleared and shaded by enormous forest trees. The lawn sloped down to the river to a beach of course city sand and a river a kilometre wide. The Swinter's accommodation was a long timber hutment operating theatre at one end, recovery room, and then Schweitzer's personal room at the other end. That's, that's the, the, the building. It was the accommodation of an ascetic. All it held was a desk and chair, a cupboard, and an iron bedstead, the measure of the man, immensely human, humbling. The door to I didn't get photographs of the inside because it was locked up. His grave. Nearby was a small graveyard with the remains of Schweitzer and a few of his close companions. Perhaps it was the village itself that had the strongest impact on me. It was just another dilapidated African village but through the clutter of dilapidation, one glimpsed bits of red tiled roof, remnants of old French occupation. As the bits coalesced in my mind, together with bits of bougainvillea and other flowering shrubs, I began to see what must once have been a beautiful little French colonial town. I've grown up in Africa, familiar with the dilapidation, dilapidated shanty Africa, just accepting what must be will be. But Lamborghini jerked my thinking. It doesn't have to be this way. In 1776, Adam Smith wrote in his Wealth of Nations, all the inland parts of Africa seem in all ages of the world to have been in the same barbarous and uncivilized state in which we find them, find them at present. There are in Africa none of those great inlets such as the Baltic, and Adriatic seas in Europe, the Mediterranean and Euxine seas in both Europe and Asia. What if Adam Smith was right about Africa? What if we can do something about it? Back in the 90s, the old Seashore Act was being revised and incorporated into the new Integrated Coastal Zone Management Act. I attended quite a few workshops on the matter and they nearly threw me out. I kept arguing that the seashore is an indeterminate thing, while the approach that they were using, that was being used was fundamentally deterministic. We could never properly represent the seashore. In Southern Africa, the coast is a scarce resource not just by Smith's observation, but by the extreme straightness of the coast as measured by its fractal index. I was able to confirm this with an accurate calculation at a nominal 50 meter step size of the fractal index of the South African coast, a number of 1.048, probably the lowest in the world for that amount of coast, a matter that generally extends to much of the shores of Africa. I have a bilingual copy of the Institutes of Justinian well, in the key passage is given as, as altum litus maris, coternus hibernus fructus maximus excurrit. I've translated this as 
The seashore, however, is as far as the greatest run-up of the winter waves. A sequence of British jurists attempting to translate this passage have all ended up with useless garble. Whoever that old Roman jurist was who wrote this must have been a friend of the sea to get it so right. What I love about the original Latin is the word excrude. How beautifully it captures the cheeky scurrying of the swash as it dashes to the terminal of the run-up. In science, the proof of a pudding is experiment. I needed to run an experiment in order uh, to see how well mere mortals can identify the high watermark in practice as implied in the law. I made contact with the professor of land survey, Jenny Whittle, and convinced her to join, join me and we put together a very successful experiment. The results of the experiment were far more serious than I, I had anticipated. We didn't try to identify the high watermark. We only asked the participants each to make their own, assess, own estimates, and then we compared them. We had three registered land surveyors amongst the volunteers experienced in fixing the high watermark. And the standard deviation of the variances between the three of them of all six sites was 1.6 meters, nowhere near cadastral standards. I cleaned up the results and got them published in SICI magazine. Jenny, however, did not think this was properly professorial. She redid it and submitted it to the Journal of the Geomatic Society. I had to admire her persistence in getting it through a difficult reviewer. When she asked to go first in the list of authors, I was happy to concede. As Smith anticipated, this characteristic of the African shores was probably being the dominant factor in the socio-economics of Africa, no amount of politics, and Lord knows we've had enough dysfunctional politics, is going to solve the problem. Only engineering intervention is going to be able to do that. And the engineers, particularly marine engineers, need to be acutely aware of the skills needed of them, not just straight technical expertise, but also sensitivity to the seashore, a blue mind. The sea is not to be found in still water of firths and forth, fjords and ponds. It is in the open sea where the waves run free where they thunder onto open shores of sand and rock, where they shape the shore to suit themselves, where the waves dance on the beach in elegant sand-shifting curves and curtsies and the foaming white ruffs, and the cheeky swash rush hither and thither as ever they will. For all my work on the seashore, on the disjunct between land and sea, I can only say that this magical place we are searching for is not a line. It is the whole of the seashore. It is a funny, fuzzy zone. It is not the world of Euclid, and no amount of legal, legalizing can make it so. It cannot be rendered into normal legal terminology. In 2018, with the assistance of the South African chapter of Pianc, I attended the Pianc Congress in Panama. There I pitched for Cape Town for the next nominally 2022, and got it. However, as a result of COVID, it has been moved forward to 2024. A short while ago, we pressed the start button, and now all is go. I've also got the organising committee to set aside a whole day of slot for me to run a workshop on African waterways. I have to admit, uh, admit that to us Africans, this does, does sound like an oxymoron. But no, the intention is to tackle Adam Smith head on. In the scale of the issues, one day is not a great deal, but it is enough to clarify the issues of what is and what could be, to prepare a resolution of these findings that Bianchi could adopt and publish worldwide to start a movement to save Africa. Some years ago, I was asked to go to Barbados to investigate a unique shiplift, a screw dock, built in 1893. Daphne was to have traveled with me, but there was a problem over her visa. 
and she missed out. The next Bianca Congress was coming up in Liverpool and my paper on the screw lock was accepted. I went to Daphne to say, don't worry Daphne, we're going to Liverpool. That was like a red rag to a bull. I will never forget her response. That girl looked at me straight in the eye. Do I look stupid, she said. Liverpool for Barbados? I had to do some quick thinking. I wrote to the chairman of the local organising committee to say that I had a problem. My wife would, would not accompany me to a dry engineering meeting. She needed flowers and she would only come if there were, were plenty of gardens and flowers for the accompanying persons. In particular, she wanted to see fields of bluebells. I got a very prompt reply from his wife that she was running the accompanying persons committee and she assured me that there would be plenty of flowers. So it was that Daphne joined me in, in Liverpool and they lay, uh, laid, laid on all the flowers she could have wanted, including bluebells. It had been my hope that Daphne could reciprocate at the upcoming PN Congress in Cape Town next year and lead, accompanying lead an accompanying person's tour to see the flowers of the Cape and her beloved Kirsten Bosch. But it was not to be. Daphne passed her away late last year. We consigned her remains, her ashes, to the deep from the north end of Landadna Beach. Still a winter beach, sand gone just ashore of cobbles and boulders. Spring was coming in. It was a beautiful sunny day and the sea was a beautiful pale teal. Among the cobbles and boulders, we found a half pool, half open to the sea. I sat there, sat there with the ashes watching the waves, my feet in the water. Then my friend the sea noticed me. Like a faithful dog, it remembered me. It surged in, it leapt all over me, just like a dog, and swamped me all over. How delicious it was to feel again the shock of that pristine ice cold water. And the water swelled again across the pool, so they absorbed her ashes in a cloud of grey. Slowly at first, in gathering speed, water and cloud departed back to the deep. It was done, Daphne had gone to the deep to join the sea she loved so much. Like my muse beside me, accepting offerings to her demean, to his demean, so the sea has accepted my beautiful Daphne, to have and hunt to hold until I can join her again.